Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce another in a continuing series of Aeronautics Research and Mission Directorate uh, technical seminars here at NASA headquarters. Uh, part of the purpose of this is to demonstrate that uh, in the phrase technical seminars here at headquarters that that is not an oxymoron. Uh, today we're privileged to hear about um, planetary entry, descent, and landing. Um, from uh, Walt England and uh, Neil Cheatwood, both of Langley Research Center. Uh, of course, we simply are not going to get humans to Mars ever uh, unless we substantially upgrade our understanding and capability of planetary entry, descent, and landing specific to Mars. And there are a lot of planets and moons in the solar system that we are not going to be able to uh, explore as fully as we'd like uh, with robotic science probes. Uh, unless and until we similarly upgrade our understanding. So uh, this is a uh, key area in which uh, ARMD uh, technology and uh, mission needs for space exploration uh, not only overlap but are inextricably in interlinked. We couldn't have two better speakers than uh, today with uh, Walt England and, and Neil Cheatwood. Walt is the head of Langley's uh, Exploration Systems Engineering Branch uh, a group whose charter includes development of advanced uh, atmospheric entry, descent, and landing technologies. Uh, he's been at Langley for 20 years. Uh, his personal expertise is in hypersonic aerodynamics, launch vehicles, and entry systems. Uh, he was responsible for the Mars Pathfinder aerodynamic database and was uh, and led the uh, aerodynamic development of X-43 uh, and X-43A uh, hypersonic flight test vehicles. He's a co-I on the Mars Entry Air Data System, part of the Mars Entry Descent and Landing Instrumentation Project, uh, which will fly on Mars Science Lab in, in 09. Walt's an associate fellow of AIAA and the author or co-author of over 50 publications. Neil Cheatwood uh, has played a number of key roles in NASA's planetary uh, atmospheric flight programs. He's nationally recognized in aerosciences and flight mechanics for planetary entry systems, and he is the PI for the uh, Mars Entry, Descent, and Landing Instrumentation Project on, uh, on Mars Science Lab. He leads Langley's efforts to develop inflatable aeroshell technologies and is the PI for uh, NASA Langley's inflatable reentry vehicle experiment, uh, as well as a follow-on program for advanced inflatable decelerators for atmospheric entry. Neil was responsible for uh, entry aerodynamic databases for the Stardust, Mars Microprobe, Genesis, and Mars Exploration Rover missions. Uh, he has also contributed to Mars Global Surveyor and Mars Sample Return Flight Projects. Neil is uh, also an AIAA Associate Fellow and the principal author or co-author of some 60 publications in fluid dynamics, atmospheric entry, and system engineering. So, gentlemen, uh, it's your show. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Ooh, excuse me. Um, so what we'd like to do today is, uh, is begin and, and tell the story about some of the requirements for and uh, technology advances that we believe will be necessary for future human advanced planetary entry, descent, and landing. So we have first slide, please. There we go. Okay, so as Mike said, we, um, both Neil and I have been involved in a number of robotic mission planetary exploration um, EDL missions, including Mars Pathfinder, dating back over a decade ago. And more recently, we've been involved in some of the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate advanced development for the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle. So this is a great opportunity for us to come and, and talk to the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate about some of these technologies that we hope they are going to work on and help develop that will enable future large mass and, in fact, human Mars exploration. So next slide, please. Okay, let me, um, let me tell you a little bit how we're going to structure this talk this morning. What we'd like to do is start with a, with a historical review and go back and look at where we've been with, in, in this case, Mars entry, descent, and landing. Okay, so like Mike said, we, we have been to other planets, flown through other planetary atmospheres, including uh, Pioneer Venus. We've been to Galileo with, uh, I'm sorry, we've been to Jupiter with a Galileo mission, and recently the Europeans went to uh, Titan, one of the moons of Saturn with Huygens. But what we're going to do today is focus on Mars, uh, 
because with the current exploration vision, that will provide the technology pull for large mass human scale requirements. So we'll talk about Mars EDL, and then I'd like to talk about the current Mars EDL technology suite, which is largely derived from a 30-year-old set of technologies that were actually developed for the Viking missions. Okay, and then we'd like to talk about some of the future EDL needs and requirements for human class missions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cheatwood here, and uh, he's going to tell you about some of the advanced technology development and challenges, some of which are going on right here in the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. And finally, we'll leave you with some summary thoughts and uh, recommendations. Okay, next slide. So let's, uh, let's set the clock back to 1971, 35 years. Um, in fact, 35 years ago today, November 27th, the Soviets actually uh, sent two probes to Mars that year, um, Mars 2 and Mars 3. And Mars 2 actually failed. It crashed on the surface of Mars, returned no science data. However, several days later, Mars 3 successfully touched down on the surface of Mars, so performed a successful entry, descent, and landing. The Soviets were the first to successfully soft land on the surface of Mars, so they get to plant the proverbial flag. Uh, unfortunately, the, the spacecraft once on the surface transmitted data back to Earth for a, a total of 20 seconds, and uh, then the signal was lost, and the, the leading theory is that they actually touched down in the middle of a raging dust storm with electrically charged particles which shorted out the, uh, the spacecraft system. However, they did successfully perform an, an EDL, the first EDL at Mars. Okay, uh, two years later, 26 months later in fact, 1974 with Mars 6 and Mars 7, again they sent two probes during this opportunity. Mars 6 failed. Um, it did successfully obtain some Mars atmospheric science data during its descent through the Martian atmosphere and telemetered that back to Earth. However, it failed again on the surface. And Mars 7, unfortunately, as it approached Mars, was released prematurely from the spacecraft and resulted in a Mars flyby instead of a Mars entry, descent, and landing. So next slide, please. This takes us to 1976 with the U.S. Viking missions, two enormously successful missions. Viking 1 and 2, uh, Viking 1, set down on the surface of Mars on July 20th, 1976, and uh, what was an enormous success followed closely by Viking 2. This summer we actually celebrated the 30-year anniversary of the Viking missions, and it is amazing the amount of science return that those two missions generated, as well as the engineering technology that were generated, and to a large extent we're still living off of today with the um, one of our planetary missions, we, we, robotic missions, we, uh, we continue to execute. So go ahead, next slide, please. All right, now we're going to roll forward uh, about 20 years to the second generation of Mars exploration, or the second wave of Mars surface exploration with Mars Pathfinder mission. Another tremendously successful mission used very similar entry, descent, and landing EDL architecture as was derived directly from Viking, essentially. So it used the same 70-degree sphere cone four-body heat shield. It used the same supersonic disk gap band parachute. It did, however, introduce the use of airbag technologies for the final descent on the surface of Mars, and then deployed a surface rover, the Sojourner rover. Um, this was a tremendous success and engaged the public it was uh, due in large part due to the f fact that the public was able to watch in almost real time live on both television and the internet. So a, a big success with Pathfinder. So go ahead, next slide please. Two years later, 26 months later, our luck turned and uh, we sent the Mars Polar Lander and it unfortunately failed. Uh, we, we believe during terminal descent onto the surface of Mars, it deployed the legs and had a premature engine shut down and the spacecraft crashed onto the surface of Mars. Uh, during that mission, we also had two microprobes that were attached to the Polar Lander spacecraft and deployed uh, immediately before entry, immediately before the Polar Lander entered the Martian atmosphere. And these were not really surface landers. In fact, they were surface penetrators intended to hard land into the surface and deploy a penetrator down into the soil of Mars. Unfortunately, after they left the spacecraft, they were never heard from again. So we actually had three failures that year at Mars. And it, it resulted in a lot of soul searching at NASA about how to do planetary missions. Okay, next slide, please. So the Europeans 
have tried their hand at Mars, and uh, they, they actually entered on Christmas Day in 2003. Unfortunately for them, they had a, uh, a pretty dismal failure as well. Um, they did not have a great deal of instrumentation on board the spacecraft, the entry system during entry, descent, and landing, so we do not know. The jury is still out as to what ultimately resulted in that failure. However, it was believed that it was probably during terminal descent, perhaps during the supersonic parachute deployment. Suffice to say, they did not successfully land on Mars and return science from that mission. Okay, next slide, please. 2004, actually it was just a few weeks later, uh, they were in December of 2003. In 2004, early January, we had two more successes with the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, very much like the Pathfinder EDL architecture using the same entry aeroshell, the same supersonic disc gap band, and the airbags, and deployed two tremendous rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, both of which are going strong today nearly three years later. Okay, next slide. So, let's look at the scorecard. Um, here's Earth's attempts at getting to Mars. The U.S. is, is five for eight, depending on how you categorize the suit two surface penetrators. Soviets are one out of four, and the Europeans are 0 for one. And this is not meant in any way as to denigrate the Soviets or the Europeans. The message here is getting down to Mars' surface is really hard, okay? So let's talk about what we think we need to do to improve upon that. Next slide, please. Okay, what, what is it that makes Mars so difficult? Well, the fact is that the Mars atmosphere, Mars has an atmosphere, albeit a very thin one, okay? So its surface density on the, on the essentially ground level is equivalent to that of Earth's at about 30 kilometers, roughly 100,000 feet. So very thin atmosphere. In fact, it's too thin to take advantage of to the extent that we do here at Earth to use to decelerate our entry vehicles like the shuttle or like Apollo or soon like the, the Orion crew exploration vehicle. Um, on the other hand, the fact that it has an atmosphere means that we still need to contend with issues such as aerodynamics and aerothermodynamics and winds and large density variations. So in a sense, it's, it's the worst of both worlds, okay? However, we, we absolutely need to take advantage of the Martian atmosphere to allow us to, to put down mass pay, massive payloads on the surface of Mars with, without having unreasonably large payloads in low Earth orbit. So just an example, as an example, if there were no Martian atmosphere and we, re we received no aerodynamic assistance from the atmosphere, it would take us approximately 20 metric tons in low Earth orbit to put one metric ton on the surface of Mars. And that's actually an idealized case for a perfect alignment of the planets and a low, low energy home and transfer. On the other hand, we believe that it, with traditional propulsion and high-performance aero-assist technologies, we think we can lower that ratio down to about five to six metric tons in low Earth orbit for every metric ton on the surface of Mars. And that's close to what we're doing today with the, with the robotic program. So the question is, if we want to put human-class payloads on the surface of Mars, will this architecture or will an architecture be derived that will work? And, and so far, all of the architectures that have been developed um, require the, the successful deployment or development of at least one low TRL level element. In some cases, many TRL, TRL technology readiness level elements. So but there are a lot of promising ideas out there and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of cartoons, shall we say. But what we really believe we need is a high fidelity systems analysis and systems engineering process to guide us to the right EDL architecture. Okay, next slide. All right, let's go back and review the, uh, the five U.S. successes. So Viking 1 and 2, Pathfinder, Spirit, and Opportunity. Okay, this is a, a topological map of the surface of Mars showing surface elevation. And what I, what I, want, to, what I want you to, to, to recognize is the fact that all, of, all five of these previous missions have landed at very low surface elevations. In fact, none of them have landed above minus one kilometer MOLA. So MOLA is the Mars Observer Laser Altimeter, which is actually used to, to, def to develop the, the data was used to develop this map. And you can think of MOLA altitude, as it's referred to, as sort of the equivalent of sea level, our Earth's sea level altitude. So everything we sent to Mars has landed below one kilometer below that reference altitude. And we need to do that to take advantage of the atmosphere to the maximum extent possible and also the timeline. Well, if we go to the next slide, 
and we'll take everything above, above that one kilometer, minus one kilometer mola, and shade it in black. And, and what you can see that it l is that at least 50% of the planet remains inaccessible if we do not have an EDL architecture that will allow us to, to, to get us above that elevation. So not only that, the southern hemisphere remains largely out of reach with the current EDL technology set. So next slide. Okay, in, in 2009, NASA is actually sending the Mars Science Laboratory mission, which is the agency's flagship mission to Mars. And the, that mission, that project, is attempting to, de to develop an EDL system architecture capable of delivering 0.8 metric tons, 800 kilograms, to a MOLA altitude of up to 2 kilometers. So if we do that, if we take that same surface topology and uh, shade everything above 2 kilometers, you can see that that, that buys us in, improved accessibility over the majority of the planet, about 80% of the planet. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about some of the, uh, the atmospheric issues, the, the, the big density variations and the unknowns associated with the atmosphere. This plot on the left is actually derived from the Mars Odyssey aerobraking uh, evolution, which took place several years ago, and it's essentially a ratio of predicted density versus actual measured density for each aeropass. And what you'll see there is a very large scatter in the data. In fact, they had density variations on as, of as much as 40% in orbit to orbit and as much as 100%, plus and minus 100% at the upper altitude. And uh, made it, made, makes it very difficult to think about sending human class missions there with that kind of uncertainty in the atmosphere. The plot on the right is actually the, the density profile in, in vertically from atmospheric interface at approximately 125 kilometers down to the surface. And you can see even down at close to surface elevations, you still see very large uncertainties associated with the atmospheric density. So what this means is we need to develop an EDL system that is robust to large density variations. Unfortunately, robustness typically means extra mass, which typically means extra cost. So, next slide, please. Let, let's review, okay? All five of the successful U.S. missions had landing elevation sites below one kilometer, minus one kilometer MOLA. They had landed masses of less than 0.6 metric tons, or 600 kilograms, and had very large uncertainties in their landed position. For example, Mars Pathfinder had a landing ellipse, a landing uncertainty of as much as 300 kilometers in a major axis. So can you imagine landing at Earth and finding a runway or a bare strip of land 300 kilometers long that would, that would allow you to, to put down, set down safely on the surface. Actually, we improved upon that for MER with improved navigation. That landing ellipse has shrunk down to about 80 kilometers. But if you think about what we're going to need to do with human-scale missions and have perhaps pre-deployed assets, we need to get those numbers down to on the order of meters or tens of meters, not kilometers. So, the second point I want to make is the fact that all of these previous missions have relied to a very large extent on the Viking technology. Okay, these are technology investments made in the 1960s and 1970s and include the aerodynamic characterization of the 70 degree, 70 degree sphere cone four body, the SLA 561V thermal protection system, and the supersonic disk gap band parachute system. Okay, next slide please. All right, let's look at the, the previous three, Viking 1 and 2, Pathfinder and Mur A and B, and the near-term future two missions, Phoenix, which will launch in 2007, and Mars Science Laboratory, which will launch in 2009. <clears throat> so what you'll see here, these are the entry arrow shells for each of those, roughly to scale, and what you'll see is they look remarkably similar. In fact, the forebody is the same 70 degrees spherically blunted cone for each of these. The aft body has some minor differences, um, but what, what you see with the Viking aeroshell is a three and a half meter diameter aeroshell which is dictated by the launch vehicle. It was launched on the payload fairing that it had to fit inside for launch. Pathfinder, MER, and Phoenix will all be launched on a Delta II launch vehicle which constrains the aeroshell diameter to 2.65 meters. Okay. MSL will be the largest aeroshell that we have ever flown at Earth or at Mars. Just point of reference, Apollo command module was about a three meter diameter entry capsule. So MSL is flying four and a half meter diameter. The new Orion crew exploration vehicle is a five meter diameter. So slightly larger than MSL, but we're going to fly this at Mars uh, 
before Orion has flown here at Earth. A couple other points I'd like to make, all right? With this particular aeroshell geometry, we are absolutely pushing to the limit its capabilities on the MSL mission. So we're flying a larger aeroshell, we're flying a much more massive entry system. In fact, MSL entry mass is about 3,250 kilograms, as opposed to the uh, 900 that were flown in Viking and roughly 500 to 800 that have been flown with Pathfinder and MER. Also, because of its size and its scale, we expect significant turbulent heating on, on the majority of the aeroshell on the, on the lee side flank, which means heating rates are going to be much higher than anything we've ever seen previously. The other thing with MSL, in order to gain that elevation we talked about, to get to the two kilometer elevation, it, it is going to fly a guided three axis controlled lifting entry trajectory, which again is pushing to the limit the performance of this entry aeroshell. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the supersonic disc gap band parachute. This was a uh, parachute technology that was developed in the late 60s and early 70s. Viking program took advantage of, of, the, of the fundamental parachute technology and extended it, qualified it to allow it to be used for the Viking missions. Disc gap band parachute is named for the circular disc of fabric on the top followed by a, a gap and then a fabric band. And actually, the, the, the big advantage of the disc gap band parachute is the fact that it has moderate drag performance, but it has very good aerodynamic stability performance, and that you can trade and modulate drag with aerodynamic stability by changing the gap height. So it has a lot of heritage at Mars at supersonic conditions and low-density atmospheres. It was flown on Viking 1 and Viking 2, Mars Pathfinder, Mars Polar Lander. Mars Exploration Rovers, MER Spirit and Opportunity, and the Europeans actually used it with their Huygens probe. And, and one of the reasons they've, they've used it to the extent that they have is the fact that it's extraordinarily costly to qualify a supersonic low-density parachute like MER, like the disc gap band. So we basically have to qualify it at Earth conditions at altitudes of up to 100,000 feet or 30 kilometers, right, to get surface conditions at Mars. Let's go ahead and the next slide, please. So during uh, the, the development of the disc gap band, supersonic disc gap band parachute, and the Viking program, they actually came up with a, a fairly innovative technique to test and qualify this parachute at relevant Mars conditions, wherein they launched the parachute aeroshell system on a high-altitude balloon that floated up to about 30 kilometers, roughly 100,000 feet where the, that system was then dropped off the balloon and a rocket ignited and accelerated the parachute and aeroshell system to about Mach 2.5 or Mach 3, where the parachute was then deployed. They had to go through a whole series of these tests to qualify that parachute to be flown on Viking. And it turns out the MSL project was looking at repeating several of these tests to get one data point for the MSL mission last year, and they estimated it was about a $50 million test to go execute. So, so very expensive to, to qualify these, these kinds of systems. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is actually the, the qualified regime for that supersonic deployment of that disc gap parachute, disc gap band parachute. And what I want to point out is the, the fact that it's been flown and qualified from a range of a little more than Mach 1, about Mach 1.1, up to about Mach 2.7, you can see on the... The, uh, the, the horizontal axis, and then the dynamic pressure range from about 1,000 pascals down to about 200 pascals. So I want you to remember those numbers because I'm going to come back and refer to them again here shortly. Next slide, please. So, so where are we today then with, with Mars robotic landers? All right. The Mars Exploration Program is attempting to develop a system with MSL to deliver 0.8 metric tons to the surface of Mars at altitudes of up to 2 kilometers. Some of the recent design reference mission studies for a Mars sample return, which is the sort of the capstone mission for the Mars robotic program, have shown requirements for Mars surface landers on the order of 1.2 metric tons, so about 50 percent more than what we're getting today out of our current system. In order to get to human scale missions, we've got an ocean to get across. We, we believe that some of the design reference missions for human missions demand 30 to 60 metric tons on the surface of Mars per landing, right? So the question is, is our current EDL architecture capable of delivering that kind of mass? And the answer is no. 
we believe, and we'd like to explore why. So go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so I want to I want to introduce a couple of a um, couple of parameters here, some terminology. I hope most of which won't be foreign to this crowd. The first one is ballistic coefficient, which is the ratio of of the mass divided by the aerodynamic drag coefficient times the surface area. Okay, it has units of kilograms per meter squared. Some people argue that it has units, means it's not a coefficient, it's a number, but I'm going to stick with convention and refer to it as a ballistic coefficient. So it's essentially a measure of inertial to aerodynamic forces. And for very large ballistic coefficients, typically means entry systems decelerate deep into the atmosphere, and the deceleration occurs lower in the atmosphere, which leads to higher dynamic pressures and higher aerodynamic heating. Okay? So the second term I want to introduce is the aerodynamic lift over drag ratio. Again, to this crowd, that shouldn't be a foreign term. Essentially, the L over D is a, is a, is a parameter which defines glide slope path during descent and may be modulated by either rolling the vehicle around the velocity vector like shuttle and Apollo have done or with aerodynamic control surfaces. Next slide, please. Okay. so. Now I'd like to introduce this concept of an EDL phase plot, which is essentially a map of, of surface elevation, I'm sorry, altitude, elevation, and velocity. So let's look at the vertical axis, the ordinate, which is altitude above Mars surface in kilometers, and the horizontal axis is velocity in meters per second. Okay, so if we're entering from Mars orbit or from an interplanetary cruise, we're entering from the top right of that plot with the goal of landing down in the bottom left-hand corner at essentially zero altitude and zero velocity. Okay, if you look closely, you can actually see some semi-vertical semi lines there. Those are actually lines of, of constant Mach number, starting at the left at Mach 1 and moving with increasing Mach number towards the right. And then there are a couple of diagonal curved lines there, which are actually isobars of constant dynamic pressure, or in layman's terms, you can think of them as as lines of constant hurricane force wind. So category one hurricane force flying into a category one hurricane force wind on the top, category five hurricane force wind in the middle, and twice a category five hurricane force wind on the bottom, right? So for the technically minded, you can think of them as lines of constant dynamic pressure. All right, so a couple of other uh, points I want to make here. If you look at that red triangular box down in the lower left-hand corner, that is actually the supersonic deployment constraint defined by that disk gap band, the current qualified disk gap band parachute. So if you look at the, the two vertical bounding lines, that's essentially Mach 2.7 and the Mach 1.1 that that parachute has been qualified towards. If you look at that upper, upper diagonal line, that's a line of, of, of constant dynamic pressure, in this case about 200 pascals, so the minim, minimal deployment pressure, dynamic pressure. The horizontal boundary on the bottom is actually a five kilometer minimum altitude that allows you, to, once the parachute is deployed, essentially the entry system timeline between parachute deployment and touchdown. And in fact, if you look closely, it may not show up here on the screen, but there's a small diagonal corner in the right lower portion of that box, which is actually the upper dynamic pressure boundary. Okay? So the idea is that when you want to deploy a supersonic disk gap parachute, disk gap band parachute, we need to be in that box. Okay, there are actually two additional boxes, the blue shaded triangular surface and a green surface next to them in the subsonic regime, and those are similarly defined. The, the blue is actually a subsonic parachute constraint box, and the green is a terminal subsonic propulsion constraint box, okay? So again, the idea when you're entering from Mars orbit or an interplanetary direct entry trajectory, you're starting up in the upper right-hand corner and flying, descending and decelerating down to the lower left-hand corner at zero altitude, zero velocity. All right, next slide, please. So let's talk about where we are, what we have actually done with the, with the robotic program. So let's take a ballistic coefficient of 100 kilogram per meter squared and an L over D of 0.24 which is not far away from what we're flying with MSL in a couple of years, okay? So we're actually entering direct from interplanetary cruise, flying from your right to my left, and you can see that the vehicle flies right into the heart of that supersonic disk gap band box and deploys a parachute. If it successfully deploys, you'll take the path on the left and continue to decelerate. Essentially what you're doing is increasing the, the ballistic coefficient
you'll increase the ballistic coefficient, decelerate, and actually touch down. Well, you get it. You get into the green box where you deploy, where you activate your terminal propulsion, and then soft land on the surface. If, on the other hand, you did not deploy the parachute, you would take the the, the trajectory on the left, and you'd basically would, would not decelerate to subsonic conditions, and you'd impact the surface at about Mach 1.1. Okay, so next slide. So let's let's look at what happens when you vary the dynamic. I'm sorry, the, the ballistic coefficient of that system. So this is the same plot. We're we're, we're zooming in now on the, the supersonic portion of the trajectory, and you can see the solid line in the middle is that same trajectory, 100 kilogram per meter squared ballistic coefficient. And if we increase the ballistic coefficient, you can see the trajectory path starts to move lower and deeper into the atmosphere. In fact, if you get up much above 150 kilogram per meter squared, you basically get yourself outside of that supersonic disk gap band box. So we can no longer use that supersonic parachute qualified to those levels. If you get, just, just for point of reference, the, the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle currently has a ballistic coefficient of about 325 kilogram per meter squared. So that vehicle would, would obviously not work with this architecture. So if we go the other way, let's, let's, let's move up that, that series of contours, basically increasing the ballistic co I'm sorry, decreasing the ballistic coefficient from 100 to 75 to 50 to 25. Now basically you get two, two knobs you can turn with a ballistic coefficient. You can, you can lower the mass, which typically doesn't happen, or you can increase the, the drag area or the aerodynamic drag. Okay, so if we could get a large aerodynamic surface area, decrease the, the, the ballistic coefficient to that extent, we could almost eliminate the need altogether for a supersonic parachute, right? So we're basically flying over that boundary and straight into the subsonic parachute or the subsonic terminal propulsive descent boundary. Okay, next slide, please. All right, now let's look at how we might use this L over D parameter to in improve our performance. So this is a, a, a direct entry. Now we're looking at a ballistic coefficient of 200 kilogram per meter squared. And you can see we, we basically fly way down low into the atmosphere. And using aerodynamic lift now, we can loft the trajectory towards the end of it and get ourselves back into that supersonic parachute deployment box. Now these are idealized cases. And if I were a mission designer, I probably wouldn't count on having idealized performance out of this, and I wouldn't count on having an ideal atmosphere on the day I was actually doing the entry. So, so this in and of itself probably isn't the answer, but it is a, a tool we can use, a knob we can use to, to tune the system. Okay, next slide, please. All right, now let's talk about what we might see with a robotic, I'm sorry, human class mission, human class masses. So now we're talking about ballistic coefficients on the order of 500 kilogram per meter squared and, and moderate to high L over D performance for a hypersonic system, 0.3 to 0.5. And what you'll see here, we're assuming that we're entering from a, a, a Mars orbit of about three and a half kilometers per second and descending deep into the atmosphere and decelerating, but we don't get anywhere close to that supersonic parachute box. In fact, this system, there's a, a large supersonic decelerator gap, and in fact, if we did not come up with some other means of decelerating, perhaps propulsive, this, this vehicle would impact the ground at something on the order of Mach 2.5. So that's a bad day for a, for a human Mars mission. All right, next slide. So here's the opposite extreme. Now we're looking at a very low ballistic coefficient. In this case, let's assume we've, had, we've either assembled on orbit some kind of a large surface area decelerator or deployed either uh, inflated or, or deployed a rigid aerodynamic aeroshell with a large 30 to 40 meter diameter for this similar kind of mass that we saw previously. In this case, you'll see, just like the previous plots, we basically fly loft up and over that supersonic box and straight down into the the uh, subsonic parachute or perhaps subsonic terminal propulsion. One, one problem, one feature or problem with, with this system is if you can imagine a, a 30 meter or a 40 meter diameter aeroshell and any significant winds down at the surface of Mars and you're going to get blown all over the surface of the planet. So you may end up paying a large propulsive penalty for, uh, for, for having to, to guide you to a precision landing site with a system like this. Okay, next slide. All right, let's talk about a brute force method of doing this. Let's assume we could do it all propulsively. We actually enter the atmosphere and decelerate to 
some supersonic or even subsonic condition and then light off an engine and just use rocket propulsion to do our final terminal descent. So a couple of curves here, the, the, the curve on the top, the green curve, actually shows the, the, the vehicle entry mass as a function of propellant mass fraction. So let's take it as an, as an example. If we had a 40 metric ton system, if you look on the vertical axis on the right, if we were initiating propulsion at Mach 3 conditions, it would require about 22 to 25 percent propellant mass fraction, so an enormous propellant penalty to be paid by, by using supersonic propulsion. It, if we could delay that initiation of, of supersonic propulsion until Mach 2, that lowers the propellant mass fractions down to, onto the order of about 18 to 20 percent. And if we waited until subsonic conditions at Mach 1 or, or, or less than Mach 1, Basically, we can't do that with a system that's anything greater than 10 metric tons because the ballistic coefficient will drive us to a trajectory that basically impacts the ground prior to, prior to um, terminal descent. Okay, so next slide. So let's, uh, let, let's talk about the, the Viking-derived EDL architecture and where we are. So we, we talked about this, this Viking system that we've been using for, for almost three decades, for more than three decades now and the fact that all five of our successful EDL systems have utilized this, this EDL architecture. If we want to put humans on the surface of Mars or if we want to do large robotic precursor missions, there are a number of challenges that we believe are out there that must be overcome. So there are a couple of things in particular. The operational approaches, for one, we haven't talked about aero capture, but if we utilized aero capture to get into a Mars orbit prior to, to descent and landing, there are some significant challenges with thermal protection systems and, and aero heating. We, we also looked at, at the large aero shell diameter requirements to maintain reasonable ballistic coefficients. So whether you assemble an aero shell on orbit or you deploy one rigidly or, or inflated, which Dr. Chiwood is going to talk about here shortly. An, another critical issue which we think needs some attention is, is the rapid transition reconfiguring the, the entry spacecraft from a hypersonic entry system to a landing system. So with our current architecture, we basically take that aeroshell and deploy it right off the front and use the, 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 the difference in ballistic coefficient between those two systems to allow the aeroshell to fall away. Well, if we had a, a higher L over D, a slender body entry system, we might not be able to take advantage of that. We'd have to, there, there are several ways that have been proposed for reconfiguring into a landed system, but I think those are things that, that certainly need some, some attention, <clears throat> as well as the issue of supersonic parachute inflation, whether or not supersonic parachutes are even viable with these large mission classes. So, so finally, again, if we're going to put humans on the surface of Mars, there, there are probably some constraints with landing system accuracy on the order of meters, not the tens of meters or kilometers that we've been used to dealing with, and, and increased system reliability. So all, all things that need to be looked at in a little more detail, and a lot more detail, if we're going to, uh, to realize human exploration on the surface of Mars. So, so my message here is, and I'll end with this and introduce Dr. Cheatwood, is the fact that we've got to get ourselves out of this Viking-derived EDL box. And I'm going to let Neil get up here and tell you about some things that are going on uh, to help us do that. Thanks, Walt. Um, before I go to my first slide, I think I'll go back a little bit to some of the things that Walt said. Um, back in 96, we had successful... Uh, Pathfinder landing. Uh, at that point, we were sending um, missions to Mars uh, every 26 months, which is the frequency of uh, optimal um, arrival uh, space. So, um, but in 98, we had a failure with Mars Polar Lander. And at that point, the agency kind of stepped back and said, we need to reassess our risk posture. Um, the first decision was to scrap the 01 lander. So our next opportunity was 2001. Uh, the decision was made not to do that lander. Um, secondly, when we looked at the O3 opportunity, that was intended to be the beginning of a Mars sample return um, mission scenario where we we're going to use the O3 and O5 opportunities to do uh, the sample return. And uh, the decision was made, well, let's try to redo Pathfinder. We'll take uh, the same aeroshell, the same disc gap band technology, everything that we developed for Pathfinder, which was basically... Uh, um, using the heritage uh, Viking uh, technologies. But let's take that system, 
replace the lander and small rover with a larger, more capable rover. Uh, and so that was the plan. We were going to refly Pathfinder. Um, as we got into developing the Pathfinder system, we realized, uh, or re-looking at the Pathfinder system for MER, we realized, you know, a lot of these things aren't very robust. Uh, if we were, had launched 10 Pathfinders back in 96, maybe seven of them would have worked. You know, maybe that's an optimistic number even. Um, but the point is, when we started looking at it, we said, we've got to build some robustness into the system so we have confidence it's going to work. As we did that, that, of course, meant more mass. Similarly, the rover, the payload side, it was growing in mass as well. So in the end, when we entered the atmosphere with the Mars Exploration rovers, they weighed 825 kilograms. The original Pathfinder was 550 kilograms. So we had been restricted to the same size aeroshell. We already talked about ballistic coefficient. We just upped our ballistic coefficient by 50%. And now if you look at MSL, we feel like we're really taxing the system at this point. We are taking more mass to the service than we ever have. Yet that technology, we're, the, that system we're developing for MSL is intended to actually feed forward to the next lander and on into MSR. And as Walt uh, showed earlier, um, the latest estimates for MSR studies are showing a 50% growth on the 0.8 metric tons to a 1.2 metric ton landing mass. So we've already grown 50% beyond MSL, and we've not even started building anything yet. So uh, there are some concerns there. So it's not just the technologies I'm going to talk about uh, in the coming slides are not just about the um, sending humans to Mars. It's also relevant to near-term missions, potentially. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I'm done rambling. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. What I've done here is uh, taken an EDL timeline. This is actually uh, an MSL EDL timeline. And along that timeline, coming from the upper left, is exoatmospheric uh, down to the ground on the, on the right-hand side, lower right. Um, what I've done is just thrown out a bunch of technologies. This is, this is nothing magic. This is just me rattling off the top of my head some, some potential technologies and tools that we could develop. So the idea here is we have certain technologies we think could uh, feed forward. We have also some tools that we need to continue to develop because we're actually having to carry some fairly large uncertainties, which also lead to mass increases uh, when we develop these systems. And I'm not going to go through all these, but some of the things are restricted to just uh, a particular phase. For instance, if you look at uh, coupled ablation, where we couple our uh, fluids codes with the uh, ablation product uh, that coming off the surface and the recession and modeling and all that stuff, that's just a hypersonic entry thing. It's not something that spans the, uh, um, the different regimes. However, something like uh, when we concern ourselves with the interaction between the reaction control system, or RCS, and the flow field about the vehicle, that interaction can impact you hypersonically in terms of localized heating. It can also interact, uh, impact you aerodynamically when you go into the supersonic regime. So I'm not going to talk about all of these. Uh, the ones I've highlighted in red I'll at least touch on in the following slides. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about is uh, the idea of using different shapes. Um, when we go to Mars, as Walt mentioned, the atmosphere is very thin. So our first priority is drag. And frankly, that's why we ended up with a 70 degree cone. When we come back to Earth with uh, sample return missions like Stardust and Genesis, we actually use a 60 degree cone because it gives us enough drag plus some added stability. At Mars, we're willing to say, hey, you know, we'll go with 70 and deal with the fact that we're not as stable. And that's one of the reasons we have larger footprints at Mars than we do at Earth. So drag's the number one thing. But we also need to keep the heating down. Uh, we have uh, some very good TPS materials, although we are trying, starting to push them with MSL and the turbulent flow. Um, but the best way to keep your heating down to your payload is to actually reduce the environment you're flying through to begin with. And so you don't rely on the TPS to do it all. Um, in addition, uh, if we start looking at other shapes where we get some lift to drag uh, for control authority, then we have to start considering other shapes beyond uh, the 70 degree cone. We're actually taking the 70 degree cone to a hiring attack than we ever have before and you know we're starting to get to our the end of our comfort zone there. So we have to consider other shapes and if we need lift not only to direct us to precision landing but also to buy us back altitude we may need to do uh, lift to drag modulation which would mean a body flap. So on the upper right hand corner we're showing you know some some concepts for control surfaces that we've proposed uh, 
uh, for 70-degree uh, cones if, you know, in the situation where we can't get our CG where we need to, to put it radially so that the vehicle will fly at angle attack. But also I've shown uh, some ellipse sled type concept, more slender vehicles that give you more L over D. Now I should point out, the L over D can fool you. If you, you, you say, oh, I got more L over D, but typically it's not just that you've upped your L, you've also dropped your D. And so as a result, your ballistic coefficient ends up going up, and so you are actually getting a penalty for going to L over D. Uh, and finally, you know, if you look at those kind of shapes in the upper right-hand corner, the, the more slender shapes, it looks like they've got a lot of volume you can use, but you need to be able to, number one, package them so that you get your center of gravity at the point that you need it for the flight, uh, the atmospheric flight stability. And then also you need to be able to actually get from this entry configuration into your landing configuration, which was the point that Walt touched on earlier. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about inflatables. That's the lower right corner. We, we certainly can use those to uh, decrease our ballistic coefficient, and I'll be talking about that more. Um, but that even there, you've got, there's, there's lots of questions we need to answer. And whichever approach we take, we are, have other issues as well. The, uh, the interaction of the RCS or the control surface with the flow field is, is uh, something we have to consider. In fact, we're having to look at that uh, um, a lot right now with MSL, and it's driven a change to the backshell TPS, for instance. Um, if we go to propulsive deceleration, what's the interaction of that with the flow field? Uh, and if we do these uh, flexible um, inflatables, what is the interaction between the fluid and the structures? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, if we do on over to assembly, assembly of rigid panels to form a larger heat shield, then we have to worry about the actual uh, joints between those when we're going through the heat pulse. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the heating environment. Um, up till now, we really haven't worried about any turbulence or radiative heating at Mars. Uh, however, with MSL, what we have is a larger vehicle than anything we've flown there before. Uh, and what we have is an interesting phenomenon where, since it's at angle of attack, there's a long running length going from the stagnation point around to the lee side of the vehicle. Running length is one of the things that drive you to turbulent flow. And when your flow goes turbulent, you get a heating augmentation. And the interesting thing was when we first started running these computations, it's like, oh, the heating is higher on the lee side than it is at the stagnation point. And we actually had folks at, at Langley and other centers saying, you know, we didn't know what we were talking about. You know, there's no way that could be. So we actually embarked on a fa fairly extensive wind tunnel campaign and confirmed the fact that, yes, it does transition to turbulence on the lee side. It does give you augmentation heating that's higher than what's on the stagnation point. And, in fact, this lower right plot is actually from a, um, not from Mars, this is actually from a Neptune study where, because we're coming into a very thick atmosphere at Neptune and a very uh, high velocity, we actually get turbulence almost on the entire wind side of the vehicle. And that turbulent augmentation is a very large factor, as you can see here. Um, the other thing you have to consider when you go to these large vehicles is radiative heating. Now, you know, everybody here has probably sat in front of a fireplace and got nice and warm. Well, you didn't actually touch the flame to get warm. You got warm from the heat radiating uh, from the fireplace. Well, similarly, uh, if you have a large vehicle with a large standoff distance between the vehicle and the shock wave, which is what happens when the vehicle is large, as the flow particles come through the shock wave, they are highly energized. They start dissociating and ionizing, and they get to very high energy states, and they actually start radiating energy. And so as you go to these very blunt vehicles, which even a slender vehicle at high angle attack can present itself as blunt, if it's blunt enough and large enough, we have to worry about radiative heating. Now, we haven't had to do that at Mars before, but we've had to do it on Earth entries. And the point is, you can see, and this is from the same study, the lower left plot, you can see on looking at the, uh, the heat rate, which is the axis on the right, but the two dashed curves, the blue and the green, show the heating rate, one from the standard convective heating like we typically have to assess, and the other is the radiative component, and you can see it's on the same order of magnitude. So as we go to large vehicles, whether they're inflatables or rigid, we have to consider at least the possibility that the radiative heating can become significant. Uh, and as an illustration, um, convective heating actually goes according to velocity cubed. So as your velocity goes up, your, uh, your heating goes up three, in fact, uh, by, by cubed. Um, but the radiative heating is on the order of velocity eighth or to the ninth even. So it, it, when it starts being important, it becomes really important. Next slide. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about deployables. It's something that um, I've been interested in for uh, several years now. Um, and in fact, several years back, we said, well, you know, let's stop talking about it and let's try to do something. And so what we did first off, we said, look, you know, we've got MSL um, coming in right now, or, or, you know, we're designing it right now. What would be the impact uh, if we were to replace the rigid aeroshell with something larger? Uh, and you can see by the comments here in the, the middle, of the, this, the, the entry has, the velocity has not changed a lot, but the entry mass has already gone from 2200 to 3200. So this is a dated chart, but this is intended just to show trends anyway. So all we did was we took our standard uh, input deck for our trajectory code, left everything the same, and just changed the diameter. In other words, changed the A in the ballistic coefficient, M over CDA. So same M, same CD, because it's the same shape, but a larger diameter. What does that do for us? Well, if you look at the, the right-hand plot, it's an altitude versus Mach plot. The blue curve is the original MSL. This was just a reference trajectory from back then. And you can see it comes down, uh, you enter at the upper right, and you drop in altitude, and then come across to the lower left at landing. And you can see a little kink in the curve down in the Mach 2 range, and that's where the parachute deploy occurs. And you can see it's at a fairly low altitude, uh, on the order of 5 kilometers. But if you instead deploy this inflatable, all of a sudden your ballistic coefficient is much lower, you decelerate at a much higher altitude. You can see that the red curve has shifted way up. And in fact, if you look at the Mach 2 condition, you're more at... Uh, you know, 20 kilometers up. We could basically land MSL on top of Olympus Mons with this. Um, the result of decelerating at a higher altitude is shown in the left-hand plot. That's a, the heating rate that corresponds to this trajectory. And you can see that the uh, heating rate went from a very large value for uh, MSL's standard uh, baseline trajectory to, to uh, dramatically reduced in the, the left-hand, uh, the, the red curve. Um, what this shows us is because we're decelerating high and we can drop that heating rate, we can actually come up with materials now. Materials have advanced far enough in the last 10 or 20 years that we actually have some materials we could make these inflatables out of that would survive this kind of heat pulse. Uh, next slide. So let me talk a little bit about the, um, the inflatable reentry vehicle experiment. Uh, experiment. Uh, IRVI. It's not really a cool name, but uh, the guys on the team came up with it, so uh, they got rid of my name. Uh, anyway. Um, what we have here, at, you know, we, we've done a lot of paper studies in the past that said, well, what if we could deploy something larger? What would it do? But, you know, it's, it's been a lot of talk, uh, and no real uh, hardware been developed, no real demonstration of this capability. Um, and, in fact, the Russians have tried it a number of times uh, with only limited success. Uh, our approach is a little different from the Russians. They're trying to actually do an inflatable uh, material a flexible material that actually is an ablator, and we're not going that route. We, we think we can make the uh, vehicle large enough in diameter that it will decelerate high enough that we don't see the high heating rates and we don't have to worry about ablatives. Um, but anyway, let's go back to Irby. Um, basically, what we wanted to do is just, it's a concept system, uh, a systems concept uh, demonstration that, you know, we can, we can build an inflation system. We actually, in this case, are launching on a sounding rocket out of Wallops. Uh, it's a suborbital flight. We go exoatmospheric. While we're exoatmospheric, we actually deploy, inflate, come back in, and then we actually have it instrumented, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, and, but we can basically measure the aerodynamic performance of the, the inflatable because the question is, does an inflatable act like a rigid? Is it, is it stiff enough in the um, flow field environment that it acts like a rigid? Um, and then we just wanted to do an end-to-end -end demonstration of this. Next slide. So this actually is the, the mission timeline. Uh, as I said, we launch on a very small sounding rocket, uh, actually the smallest one they have. Uh, that's offered some interesting challenges because if, uh, from the previous slide, if you could see that the, uh, the, the stowed volume actually fits in like a 15-inch diameter uh, cylinder. Uh, and from that, I'm mixing measurements here, but from that 15-inch diameter, we actually deploy to 3 meters. So it's only order of, a, order of magnitude change in diameter. Um, and that has caused us some, uh, uh, some consternation, but we've, we think we've uh, handled most of those uh, problems at this point. So we will launch off of a sounding rocket. Uh, we'll separate from the telemetry module and the nose cone, and then we, and while we're out in the, outside the atmosphere, we will actually um, deploy this device and inflate it uh, to uh, the desired pressure before we come into the atmosphere. And then we'll uh, actually go through the pressure pulse heat and what little heat pulse there is. Um, and at that point, the uh, experiment's over, and you know 
several minutes later, it actually will drift all the way down to the surface of the, of the ocean. Next slide. Uh, I didn't mention instrumentation. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of lab tests to understand the contact resistance between these various layers. Uh, I should talk a little bit about the system. On our outer layer, we have a couple layers of, uh, of Nextel. That's our heat shield material. It's a, a ceramic fabric. It's an open weave. So behind it, we had to put layers of Kapton film to present the, prevent the hot flow from actually getting into our structure. The structure is made of Kevlar. And in fact, the innermost part, the bladders, uh, which maintain, uh, contain our pressurized gas, are uh, silicon-coated Kevlar. Uh, these are not exotic materials. Uh, there are more exotic materials that can handle more uh, heat. But we, again, we were just trying to do a bare bones, uh, it was very low, a fairly low budget operation we had, uh, a bare bones uh, attempt to show uh, what we uh, can potentially do with a system like this. But even though we didn't have a lot of budget, we did realize the real importance here is to be able to calibrate the tools we use to, divide this, to, to design this. And so what we did was we put in uh, in-depth uh, temperature uh, uh, sensors, thermocouples, so that we can actually verify the response that we predicted through the depths of these layers. Uh, we also have a, a, a surface distribution of temperature that we can calibrate to. Uh, we have uh, a convenience we don't have on Mars in that, in addition to our IMU, we have a radar track. You know, if we could set a couple of radar installations at Mars first before we went in, we could do a really good reconstruction, but we don't have that luxury. Uh, we do have it here. Uh, we will be able to um, reconstruct the trajectory, get an angle of attack history, but also, more importantly, assess the drag performance of this thing. Does, does it act like a, a, a rigid? Um, and then finally, we, on the back side, we actually have mounted cameras so that we can get a stereophonic image of the back shell, and we'll actually be able to pull out some of the uh, uh, modes of structural deflection if there are anything significant there. Uh, next slide. As um, was mentioned, I'm uh, the, the uh, principal investigator for this, so you know, as a proud papa, I felt like I should you know, show some photos. But this is uh, the real Irvy flight hardware. Um, on the left-hand side, the lower left, is the assembly at the back end of this structure. You can kind of see the, um, the um, inflation system. It's a simple blow-down uh, system. It's basically a scuba tank with you know, a couple of pressure regulators on it. In the front half, we have all the electronics, the instrumentation feeds, uh, the IMU, et cetera. Um, the upper left uh, photo is actually once we have that system integrated into the, the rigid center body. Um, the upper right image is the inflatable at ILC Dover, uh, at the acceptance testing. ILC Dover, the, the folks that built the airbags for Pathfinder and MER also were the ones we partnered with uh, to actually build the inflatable. And then the lower right was after a successful deployment test at Langley uh, in our 60-meter uh, vacuum chamber. Next slide. I don't want you to think I'm Mr. Inflatable Boy, so I wanted to move on to something else. Um, going back to the uh, parachute, um, you know, uh, Walt mentioned that uh, for MSL, they had looked at, you know, investing, say, $50 million in uh, a, a test to actually push the, uh, the envelope for the supersonic disk gap band parachute. Um, there's some issues with that. If you look at this plot here, I've, I've plotted the drag coefficient versus Mach number, um, and just focus on the, the black curve. Um, but you can see a couple of things there. One, there's this drag bucket, and I'll talk about that in a little bit around the, the uh, Mach 1 transonic region. And the other is, suppose we could go beyond Mach 2, Mach 2 and a half, Mach 3. You can see how the drag coefficient's falling off. So even if you could go to those higher conditions to deploy, you would have to make the chute even bigger just to keep up with the CDA that you'd like to have. And if you want to increase it further, you have to go to even larger size. In addition, you know, the, the materials we've traditionally used for parachutes are not that great with heating. So as we go up in Mach number, the heating's going to go up, and there is a, a real thermal concern there. Next slide. So what I've done here is taken that, that same black curve and plotted it against um, the drag coefficient for uh, several rigid shapes. Um, and I'd say rigid shapes. I actually pulled this data from the Mars microprobe database for the 45-degree cone. Uh, the 60-degree 60 60 degree data is from uh, Stardust Genesis, and 70 is uh, Viking data. And what you, uh, let's talk about a few things. Like I said, it's from the rigid, uh, it's a rigid aeroshell, but we expect that we can pressurize this system enough that we get stiffness sufficient to give us similar drag performance. And there's uh, a few 
comments I wanted to make here. The first one is we don't have this transonic drag bucket, as you can see. Um, and that's actually significant. When, when we talk about uh, a Mars entry, the timeline is critical. Uh, we actually, when we design an entry, we say, okay, we want to be here, and then we start marching back. Well, it takes this much time to do this, this much time to do this, and we, we hopefully don't run out of time before we run out of atmosphere. Um, but in that timeline sequence, right now, what we do on the entry systems is we deploy the parachute in the Mach 2-ish uh, level, and even though we're decelerating under that chute and we'd like to get rid of the heat shield as soon as possible because of thermal soak back, we actually hold on to it till about Mach 0.8. And one of the reasons is we don't want to release that heat shield expecting it to fall away right when the parachute stops giving us the drag we expect so that it recontacts us. So that's a significant, uh, I won't call it a feature of a parachute, but it's a significant characteristic of a parachute uh, that we can avoid potentially with these inflatables. Um, the other thing is you can see uh, across the board, we, we see higher drag coefficient with these inflatables than we do with a parachute. And that's because a parachute's fairly inefficient. It's actually spilling flow over the edges all the time. So uh, the drag coefficient's higher. That means for the same CDA that we'd like to have, we can actually make this thing smaller. Now, its aerial weight is much higher than a, a parachute, but hopefully we can mitigate some of that. Um, the next thing uh, is as not only is it higher in general, it also maintains that higher level as you go up in Mach number. Now, the 45-degree cone will tail off some, but you can see the 60 and 70, basically, we, we could go up to Mach 4, Mach 5, and, and still see the same drag performance. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is actually the stability of this thing. Um, with um, a parachute, you have a three-body motion. You've got the parachute deployed from a back shell, and then the payload underneath it. So you get this elbow motion, as the JPL folks like to talk about. Um, you don't get that with these because it's, you don't have three bodies. You've got the single body with an inflatable that comes out from the payload. You don't have this flow in between them. And actually, because this inflatable would have the payload kind of tucked in it, think of a bowl, a big bowl with one scoop of ice cream. That, that's your payload. You know, it's not, it, whereas Irvy's got like about four or five scoops of ice cream, which is, uh, you know, looks like a sombrero. But this is, you know, think of a bowl with an ice cream scoop in it. Because you don't really have an aft body to act on, you don't have the dynamic instability concerns that we have with most blunt bodies. So if you've uh, if you know much about EDL, you know that you know, we added, for Stardust, we added a drogue chute because the, uh, the vehicle was going to go to higher and higher angles of attack. That was a dynamic stability concern. With Genesis, we had to go even higher in Mach number for that drogue chute to make it work. Uh, we've seen the same growth uh, with all of our probes at, at Mars. Um, but what we do to characterize that is we'll actually go to a ballistic range, uh, like there's one at Eglin, there's one at Ames, there's one at Aberdeen near here. Um, in those ballistic range, we'll fire a shot out of a, a cannon, basically, and at 50 stations down at Eglin along the way, we'll take a vertical and horizontal picture. And so you'll get, a, you'll get an orientation history, and with the time stepping, you get a velocity history. And we can do a reverse engineering reconstruction of that and actually come up with what was the drag performance. And more importantly than the statics, we can actually pull out, is it dynamically unstable or not? This image you see on the upper right here is actually where we tested the Irvy shape. And this is, the, I've, I've done ballistic range tests for Genesis, Stardust, MER, been involved in a number of these things. And I will tell you, this is the first time I've gotten an image back from the ballistic range where the vehicle is flying at zero degrees angle attack. That's how stable this thing is. This is not a coincidence. This, this thing is that stable. So we, we think it'll be much more directionally stable than a parachute. Next slide. There's a lot of words on this slide. I'll try not to uh, read them verbatim. Um, but but the, I mentioned earlier fluid structures interaction. Um, we looked at fluid structures interaction actually historically for airplanes. Um, transonic wings, uh, rigid wings at transonic flight, that's air elasticity flutter. Um, we haven't traditionally worried about them, uh, FSI, for um, these large vehicles, uh, at uh, large blunt vehicles at Mars, although we have had to consider the stiffness of the structure for MSL because it's getting so large it actually was starting to bend. So we started considering it there. But actually the big thing is when MSL decided they couldn't afford to push the envelope for the supersonic parachute, they actually started investing in a coupled computational fluid dynamics, finite, finite element code matching, uh, that, and that's the FSI. So we're trying to start looking at that. Um, so this is uh, actually something that we need to look at for supersonic chutes. 
We need to look at it for uh, any inflatables we might want to look at as well. And why do we want to do this? Well, if we, if we have that capability, we can take existing data we have in the wind tunnel and try to, try to make sure we're getting the physics right on that, and then we try to take it to flight. Because what we want to do is try to optimize the design before we commit to a, an expensive flight test. And we want to be able to take subscale test results and scale them up to full scale, and then use that full scale information once we do have some test data and use that for qualification testing of new designs. So there, there's a desire to really develop this code. And I have to tell you, right now, the capability is not there. In fact, we, we kind of say for CFD in this uh, case, it's color for dollars. You know, it's just pretty pictures. Uh, we don't really believe what we're getting yet. Um, but with, with data from various missions, like, like Irvi will pro provide us some data on that with continued work and ground-based facilities, we hope to get there for inflatables. Similarly, uh, those type of things are going on right now for parachutes. Next slide. Um, I'm not sure if Walt actually talked about supersonic propulsion or not, but you know he did indicate subsonic propulsion. If we could, if we can come in with some of these systems, we might be able to el actually eliminate a system. So if we could take our hypersonic entry system down low enough and bring our propulsive system up high enough, we might be able to close that gap and not have to have that 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 parachute in there at all. I'm not sure if we can get there and at what masses we can do that, but th it is a possibility. The nice thing about propulsion is you can, if, if you've got enough propellant and you've got enough control authority, you can do a much more precise landing than relying on the aerodynamics. In, in fact, the aerodynamics and the winds now become a secondary effect. The, uh, the propulsion takes over the whole thing. And um, so there are some real advantages here. The disadvantage, of course, is it does take propellant. And, um, and Walt illustrated that earlier about the mass fraction required to actually just ignore the atmosphere. And I would actually say it's probably even higher than that number because that's as if there's no atmosphere there. The fact is there is an atmosphere there, and even if you're not using it, you've got to account for it in terms of uh, the aerothermal environment, et cetera. Um, other disadvantages is we don't really know. Our, so we're saying supersonic uh, propulsion. Well, that means you're firing a supersonic you're firing uh, your, your rocket into supersonic flow coming this way. Well, how stable is that plume in that environment? And also, if you've got, you've got to worry about the RCS flow interactions. The same thing we're looking at for MSL, but even greater, potentially. And finally, here you are now. You're, you're firing this, this engine, and you're actually flying into the burnt products. So you've got to worry about contamination on your lander. Uh, next slide. Um, Walt also mentioned this, um, you know, with, with Pathfinder, Polar Lander, and even with MER, our landing ellipses are on the order of uh, 100 kilometers or more, and that's indicated by this largest ellipse that you can barely see at the outer regions here. Uh, with MSL, through, you know, improved naviga interplanetary navigation and through um, our lift vector enabling us to use guidance to direct the vehicle, we can get it down on the order of the 10 kilometer uh, ellipse or circle shown there. Um, but that's still, that's not where we need to be for humans, because if we have to pre-deploy uh, assets, so maybe we split it up to have really heavy entry vehicles that land with less precision, and then we bring in the crew in a smaller vehicle that we can use the, the aerodynamics to get us close to it, we really need to get on the order of tens of meters uh, in that kind of precision. We're just not there. Uh, next slide. We've talked some about flight instrumentation. Um, why do we need it? Well, you know, we use these, um, these codes that we have, but we know they're not perfect, and so we have to actually bound our aerodynamic coefficients and our estimates of the atmospheric properties and what we think the aerothermal dynamic uh, environment's gonna be, the aerothermal dynamic environment's gonna be. We have to couch all those in margins. When you use those margins in the uh, design of the system, that actually means more mass. And we have some pretty large uncertainties on some of these things because we're, we're doing uh, things on MSL we haven't done before. We haven't worried about turbulence before, as an example. So we need to reduce our existing uncertainties. Well, it requires flight data. Now, we've had a number of missions and recent opportunities that basically had no flight data. And to me, the one that, that really irks me is this last one I've got listed here, Huygens. They actually did have two thermocouples. And right before entry at uh, Titan, they just said, well, we're not going to turn them on. You know, we're not, we're not going to collect the data. So that's unfortunate. Um, next slide. But the good news is, uh, as 
was mentioned earlier, we do have uh, Mars EDL instrumentation that is now going to fly on MSL. Um, and this is due largely to the fact that three uh, directorates here uh, have worked very well together to get this to happen. ARMD, uh, SMD, and ESMD are making this happen. Um, now, we're kind of late in the mission, so we can't really put anything on the back shell, but on the four body, we're, uh, we've got a nice little instrument uh, suite here, seven TPS plugs and pressure ports. What that means is within these uh, TPS plugs, we can actually have uh, stacked thermocouples, um, and we'll also have a recession sensor that kind of sticks up and burns away as the material recesses. We'll have those located in this region where we're predicting high turbulence, and we'll be able to then verify that we did, in fact, transition to turbulence and, and determine the heating le level rate that we see from the turbulence and also verify the material response. The, the pressure ports uh, are linked to uh, a set of transducers, and that system will serve as the first FAD system on Mars, and that flush air data system will allow us to decouple the aerodynamics from the atmosphere. Right now, when we reconstruct a trajectory, we basically assume perfect aero. And, and work with it that way. But this will allow us to say, well, this was the density component, this is the wind component, and this is the alpha and beta. So it's a very exciting opportunity. I'm glad to be involved with that. Next slide. My summary comments, uh, you know, we, we've told you about where the EDL technology uh, toolbox stands now. It's largely a Viking uh, heritage with some recent investments to expand its envelopes a little bit. Um, but we can't get there from here unless we invest in future technologies and tool development. We, you know, we can't just come up with a technology and say we're going to fly it. It really needs to be flight qualified technology. So there is a, a, an investment to make not just in the design, but actually a, a, a test program that shows it's going to work. We need to improve our tools, as I've mentioned earlier. But the best way to improve, improve the tools is to get flight data. Now with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague, Walt England, uh, who has rejoined us on the stage here. And he's going to make some final comments. Okay, so let me uh, let's, let's share a few few final summary comments and thoughts with you. Go ahead, and next slide. Next slide. There we go. Okay, so so you've seen all of this. We've talked a lot about these different technologies and the fact that we've been flying the same EDL architecture for three or four decades now. We, we believe what we we the eight being the agency need to do is, is look at, at a detailed EDL system architecture study and define credible EDL system requir technology requirements for human class and large robotic missions. Okay, we, we need to take that architecture and define the technology development paths. What is it going to take and how long is it going to take to develop these technologies and, and decide what the right set of technologies are. These candidate technologies might include things like these rigid deployable aero shells or inflatable aero shells like Neil's so fond of. Um, Supersonic parachute, is there anything left to be mined out of that? Supersonic propulsive deceleration may be the brute force approach, but if you think, just like Neil said, about flying supersonically through a wake flow and all the controls and aero propulsive interactions that go on with that, I think there's a, a whole lot of technology investment and, and research that needs to go into developing both the, the experimental and the computational capabilities to be able to define that kind of flow structure. So uh, there are a whole host of, of candidate technologies. There may well be others out there. We, we believe Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate can help identify and promote and develop those technologies. But we also think we need to make some pretty significant investments in the, in, in the tools and the models, aerodynamics and aerothermodynamics, atmospheric density and winds, all of these things, the tools and models that, that we have for Mars right now are, are, are based on technologies again, modeling again, that was, that was developed back in the days of Viking, so three and four decades old. So with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll end. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to come here and, and talk to you today. I think we'll turn it back over to J.D. and, and take some questions. Thank you, Walt. I'm J.D. Harrington. I'll handle the question and answer portion of today's uh, session. Uh, if you would, before you ask your question, wait until the microphone gets to you and then introduce yourself as well. Uh, are there any questions here at the headquarters? Okay, we can come over here. Hi, uh, Murray Hirschbein, ARMD. I will. Uh, when you folks looked at the large inflatables, did you also have pay any consideration to the static stability and rigidity, and what kind of pressure you would need on the inside to do it? And if you did, what the 
but what the further implications may be from the surface heating on taking that pressure higher than you wanted it to be? I mean, some of these things are going to be really tough to scale beyond a few meters. Well, I can tell you uh, in the case of IRVI, uh, we, what we have is a regulator system that keeps us 3 PSI above ambient through the entire trajectory. And in our tests that we've done, that, uh, we've seen that that stiffness is, it, it's, even at the hinge point where the inflatable touch, uh, attaches to the center body, we're in pretty good shape. But you've t touched on a real issue here. We've not looked at that at any, uh, to any fidelity yet. That, that, that would be part of these system studies. Do you have any idea what the pressure would need to be at, say, a 60 meter for a human size system? I would think it would be, as, tor as far as the pressure, it would be whatever the dynamic pressure we're seeing flying through, and then you've got to up that. So it, it's a delta on that, based on some previous literature, but we've, we've got to uh, investigate that further. Yeah, and I think that's an area where the, the, the an investment in fluid structures interaction would help identify those kinds of requirements. Okay, are there any other questions? I have one or two that was emailed in. Uh, uh, the, the question is, uh, the EDL problem is critical for human missions to Mars due to the very high mass entering the, uh, the Mars atmosphere. However, this is a round trip uh, session, so how could the requirements for an orbiting Mars return stage with an Earth EDL system affect your analysis? Well, so, so the requirements for Earth are very different than they are at Mars, due largely to the fact that Earth has a, a fairly significant, very dense atmosphere, and, and, and we know to a large extent, how to fly through the Earth's atmosphere. So, so yes, we believe the requirements for the Earth system would, would be very different from that of Mars, whether or not we could design a system that would be capable of, of working through, flying through both, both atmospheres, or we'd have to have two separate EDL architectures and two separate systems remains to be seen. But I think that's an area where these big architecture, system architecture studies can, can identify requirements for, for future EDL architectures, both at Earth and at Mars. One more question here. Uh, since we want to land at a precise location on the Martian surface, is there going to be an issue with being too efficient and decelerating too fast or going too slow at too high an altitude? In other words, colliding to the landing site? Well, certainly, um, if you go back to the plot I showed about MSL increasing it to 15 meters, uh, we certainly wouldn't advocate decelerating up to um, yeah, at 20 kilometers being ready to deploy a parachute, that's, that is too high. We, we do need to tailor it to a given application, but it, that is, it's going to be application dependent. If we're taking this mass to this elevation, we need to size the, the whole EDL system accordingly. Any questions from the audience here? Stand by for just a moment. And I, and I believe the presentation will be... Yes, yeah, so we will be able to get a copy if necessary. Plus, it will be on the uh, ARMD website. Back when I used to try to actually add value, um, in, in one of the many studies that were done on this stuff in, in earlier years and even earlier decades, I, I at least became somewhat enamored of bent biconics as a, an approach at Mars because... Your own charts show that you know when your when your L over Ds are in the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 range, it's it's really tough to get the kind of control you need. But with with that plan form, you can get up around hypersonic L over Ds of closer to one, and then you have the possibility of of really flying an, an entry corridor within the Martian atmosphere for a very lengthy period of time, ultimately nulling out most of your forward velocity and, and, and then th now you get it within the range where you really don't need a parachute because all you have is a, uh, a vertical descent and landing from, from some altitude that you choose depending on the requirement. I, I mean, I, I didn't see anything in your talk about really looking at um, uh, at things from that point of view. You doing any thinking along those lines, or has that been found to be worthless? Absolutely not. I, th I think there is a, a requirement that we go and look at higher performance shapes, and certainly the bent biconics 
fit into that class. We, we've looked at slender mid LRD and, and high LRD in the hypersonic world. That's typically defined as on the order of one, so, so right. not a high performance glider. Um, but, but like Neil said, the, the problem is it's not just the L over D, it's the L over D and the D. So we're, we're actually working the, the exact opposite problem that aerodynamicists have worked for, for 100 years, right? We're trying to maximize D as well as keep the, the L over D at reasonable levels. So with a bent biconic, you might get the L over D performance, but you don't necessarily get the D that drives the ballistic number. So we think that's part of the architecture study. There are high performance mid L over D and high hypersonic L over D shapes that need to be explored. But for a given L over D, the drag is going to basically trade off against heating. Ab absolutely. And, and so, you know, to a certain extent, it, it adds mass to deal with thermal control, but to a certain extent you can decouple them a little bit. Another, another way to go at this might be to look at what kind of an L over D do I have to have to minimize total system mass, L over D and drag, L, L, L over D and ballistic coefficient, mm -hmm. to, to minimize total system mass, and then say to the designers, okay, this is, these are the numbers I need. Design me the plan form that gives it to me. And, and that is precisely the architecture requirements study that we, we think needs to be done. Okay, well, we're going to be absolutely. kicking off a Mars architecture study in the not very distant future at all, so you may get an opportunity to... Throw in. I, I just was, if we go at it from a different direction, you might come mm -hmm. up with some other thoughts. Right. Anyway, just a thought. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, we have one more over here in the third row. Hi, Jay Dreyer from ARMD. Uh, one question, uh, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk the, the uncertainty in the app, uh, from the atmospheric data. Do you uh, anticipate that there'll be uh, anything collected, any new data or opportunities to, to have a better understanding of, of the Martian atmosphere that, that might be able to drive those uh, uncertainty uh, barriers down uh, or factors down for, for that might in turn make uh, some, uh, uh, allow you to make some trades into your EDL system? Absolutely. So, so right now, orbiting Mars is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it does have a, an atmospheric science instrument on board that spacecraft. So it's taking a multi-year atmospheric sounding and, and will help improve the, the existing Mars atmosphere models. There is a 2013 mission opportunity where, where they're actually developing the science requirements right now, and included in that are, are some atmospheric, additional atmospheric measurements that would enable some of these types of, of EDL systems, but you're absolutely right. The atmosphere, knowing the atmosphere to a much, much more precise extent than we do today is critical to, to sending humans towards Mars. And if I can add to that, um, with the MSL instrumentation that we're doing, with the FAD system, we will, along an MSL trajectory that is both given, going to give us a, the vertical component for that trajectory, but also it has a lofting feature that gives us a fairly long horizontal run, we will gain a lot of data in that, in that fashion from the FAD system. All right, any more questions? One more here and uh, we'll try. Uh, could packaging all of this into a launch vehicle, you mentioned that uh, during your presentation, affect your decision on the very best possible EDL system that we, we can design, and particularly for science missions or for human missions for that matter? How much emphasis do you put on meeting the criteria for the launch? Well, well the launch vehicle is what it is, and we're, we're not going to change that, right? So, so we've been constrained in the past by, by previous launch vehicles, and the Ares 5, the new uh, crew launch vehicle, cargo launch vehicle is being developed, will be the largest payload fairing, largest, most massive uh, launch vehicle available to us, so we will very likely have to use that as the constraint that will define the EDL architecture that will eventually take us to Mars. Okay, seeing no further questions, that's going to conclude today's presentation. I'd like to thank Walt Engelin and Neil Cheatwood for their time today. Thank you. And if you'd like more information about NASA's aeronautics programs, go to www.aeronautics.nasa.gov. Thank you.